audience certainly over here and also on the web. Uh, hopefully we'll get a tally as to how many uh, uh, patients uh, are listening, number one. Number two, the significant others. Number three, the patients who are interested in getting the implants because that's also a very important uh, population of patients that uh, are want to be, or uh, hopefully not to be, uh, patients that listen in and basically make use of this information. Um, there is a lot to talk about, as you will see, uh, and hopefully uh, in a timely fashion, I'll be able to go ahead and go over my talk. Um, I will go ahead and then go over one or two videos just so that I can explain to you what I did just recently. And then lastly, I'm going to have a special guest who's going to come and uh, join us uh, over here. Uh, and then I will do a uh, question answer session. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask uh, any questions that you may have. So breast implant illness um, is basically a constellation of signs and symptoms uh, that the patients uh, experience that ultimately affect every part of the body, literally every uh, aspect, every tissue, because what you have is a autoimmune generated response secondary to the foreign body, which is the implants themselves and thereby affecting, depending on the person's physiology, what they're basically uh, uh, have the potential uh, to as far as connective tissue disorders that, may, that they may be predisposed to. So patients come in with a whole series of complaints, uh, many of which are from headaches to shortness of breath, uh, loss of hair, uh, uh, you know, ear uh, ringing, uh, what they call tinnitus, uh, neck pain, back pain. Uh, they also complain of uh, complaints of uh, shoulder pain, uh, tingling in bilateral upper extremities. Uh, they complain of vision changes, uh, basically change of taste. And, uh, you know, there's a whole series of 40 to 50, uh, 60, whatever complaints and vague. Uh, but then if you look at them as a cluster, you will basically start to see a pattern that starts kind of attributing uh, their illness to a common uh, denominator that they have, which is the breast implant illness. Now, I've said there are patients that are predisposed to diseases and illnesses like we all do. Uh, and so the, the goal here is to be able to and I tell the patients kind of come up with the diary so that we can define a pattern so that there are a set of symptoms depending on what part of the day, what type of compromise that they have. For example, uh, not being able to get out of bed, not being able to exercise, brain uh, fog, uh, fatigue, uh, sign symptoms of arthritic pain, um, and as you will see, this is a questionnaire that I have that I give uh, to all my patients so that as they come in, I can kind of get an understanding as to what is it that they are primarily complaining of so that I can get an understanding of the severity of the illness. So as you will see, um, you know, and many of us have looked online on YouTube and also on uh, so many other uh, social media outlets as far as uh, the complaints that the patients have. Uh, and many of my patients uh, say that this is exactly the same pattern because we cannot, or my primary care doctor cannot attribute it to uh, that one specific illness. Um, so uh, now this is, uh, you know, another very common problem is uh, psych related. So many of my patients have gone to the psychiatrist. They've been put on antidepressants, anxiety, fatigue. Um, when someone has a problem with difficulty breathing, what happens? It leads to more anxiety. When someone has a problem with insomnia that they cannot sleep and fatigue, that leads to basically more anxiety, stress, lack of sleep, and all of a sudden this translates to in the day-to-day -day activities, the social compromise, being able to function and being able to be productive. You know, patients have had suicidal ideations, they have had problems with literally each one of these problems, some more, some less, some none. Now, some patients may have just five or 10, some patients have 30 to 50, and they just keep checking, as you will see. Uh, the most common being uh, shortness of breath. Um, number two, psych mood disturbances, changes where they're not 
excited about getting up and say, for example, going to a wedding. Uh, small things that you would take for granted, uh, but they themselves find it a challenge to be a burden for them to be able to even, for example, calling it and saying because they just cannot get out of bed. They are just like as if they just ran a marathon. That's how tired they are. They have gone to their endocrinologists. They have had their thyroid tests. Uh, they have had, you know, name me every system of the body, the central nervous system, the rheumatological system, the GI system, the cardiology uh, visits, uh, where they have had a Holter monitor, chest x-rays, they have had uh, obstructive sleep apnea studies, uh, they have had a whole series of and battery of tests uh, that ultimately point to nothing. Uh, and then all what they're told is, well, ultimately the final common denominator is you need to go see a psychiatrist because uh, ultimately this is what the root cause of the problem is because they cannot think of anything else. Uh, you know, another very common problem is the, ir uh, the irritable bowel or bladder. Uh, that's also uh, what patients uh, present with uh, that ultimately is, uh, you know, related ultimately to the stresses of the body. Uh, so as you can imagine, people who undergo a lot of stress, they ultimately affect their GI system. So they have to go to the bathroom more, they get diarrhea, or they get constipation, and so very common problem. So there are different types of surgeries, and if you can, uh, the take home message here is, what is the best surgery that will suit you? And I say this, in general, as far as the gold standard, and I will prove it to you from my experience as a board-certified general surgeon and as a board-certified plastic surgeon. As you will see shortly, the end block removal is the gold standard versus the total capsulectomy, which basically means that you're removing the capsule in its entirety, 100%, because the word total, not 90%. Uh, Lori, in between clinic this morning, showed me, uh, my office manager, uh, a series uh, of pictures uh, of a patient who had the explant done, but 90% of the capsule was removed. And if you saw the capsule, you would see that it has been removed in multiple pieces, 10 to 15% at a time, and then all of a sudden it's clustered together as a picture and said a total capsulectomy. So the goal here is that you don't want the capsule to release its contents, and as you will see shortly, because that's where the disturbance lies. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to show it to you. The other common problem that I find from my training and per my discussions from the many different plastic surgeons that I talk to, you come in into the plastic surgery office, you complain of chest tightness, it is consistent with what is a grade three or grade four capsule or contracture, which basically is the capsule getting hardened. And then what the surgeon ends up doing inevitably is to basically score the capsule, which means taking a bovi cautery, which is a cutter, and then opening up or releasing the scar such that it basically, that pressure is alleviated and it opens up and then it's able to accommodate another implant, larger size, because you now have increased the volume and it's not a tight capsule no more. So that's in red for a reason, along with the implant removal only, which is certainly not recommended as you will see shortly, you want to remove the capsule because that's where the burden lies as well. So what is an end block resection? As you will see, it's an implant and the capsular tissue that surrounds the implant uh, that is removed as one entity, one piece, so that the implant has not seen air and that it is encased within the capsule and there is no spillage. So you may have an end block removal and ruptured implant, but guess what? It has not leaked into the chest cavity and so that's pristine and preserved and you don't need drains you don't need to do a frank washout and the susceptibility of potentially not removing the entire diseased uh, implant capsule does not exist for that reason because you have removed that entire capsule along with the implant as one entity. So it's a difficult procedure to perform because if you're off by a couple of millimeters, you could go into the chest cavity, which is a major problem because you could 
puncture the lung, and this is what you see, the pneumothorax. You have to get a chest tube, and it's basically an emergency because uh, the patient's not able to breathe. It's, uh, the patient's going to be gasping for air. And so on an anesthesia table, as you will see, that is a what I would call a surgical emergency where you have to intervene surgically and putting in a chest tube. And so because you are in patients who have had the implant put directly underneath the muscle, which means on top of the chest wall, the rib itself, uh, it's a very challenging operation, especially when the capsule is very thin. So docs who are trained in trauma slash chest reconstruction, micro uh, dissection, and again, I have to say it is a very difficult operation. Not everyone can do it. Um, and you have to be comfortable about operating in the chest, very important. It's not as simple as just peeling it off or removing it. You have to actually bovie it off, and as you will see shortly. Um, the capsule adheres to the ribs, the muscles, uh, which are in the close proximity, and hence this is a difficult operation. If your surgeon comes, again, take home message and says, I did the end block in 25 minutes, that's virtually impossible. Your surgeon, uh, like I was telling one of my patients, how are you? I said, I am tired because I just finished an end block, and it took three hours. So on a day that I do three, for example, it essentially takes me from 8.30 in the morning till approximately 6.30 or so, uh, giving four hours or so, three to four hours of time in order to doing it correctly because it's a very tiring operation. You just have to keep an eye on the bovie and you have to dissect around the entire capsule and you have to do a meticulous dissection because you, don't, you cannot go fast. It is very similar to, if you can imagine, patients who have had bowel surgery. You have the small bowel or the colon that's adhered and you have adhesions within the abdomen. You have to very meticulously with the tenotomies, with the scissors, being able to dissect the bowel because you don't want to puncture the bowel, then you're going to have spillage of the contents. That's a major problem. Similar, very analogous dissection. Um, and for my general surgery years, I find that I extrapolate and say, you know what, this is very similar to uh, that type of dissection. And so, um, as you can see right here, uh, this is a uh, patient that I just did, uh, this is, I always prefer the IMF because you don't want to go around the duct, very limited access. You cannot get a end block removal through a two centimeter nipple incision. It's virtually impossible unless you're a magician. Number two, you cannot go from the axilla. You have to have, if you can get an implant, just lay it flat and it's scar tissue, you have to have at least 11 or 12 centimeters of base length right here, as you can see. And you will see on the videos that I uh, basically have on my uh, YouTube channel, Con Plastic Surgery Academy, I clearly mention, and I put a ruler here and I measure, this is the capsule, as you will see, this is the fatty tissue. Now this is abnormal tissue uh, right here. I want to go ahead and remove it. I don't want to remove just the capsule. You want to remove anything that's indurated that may have potentially silica because remember it bleeds. There is a micro bleed. And you can tell by the consistency and texture of touching the capsule. It's very, very dramatic. You will be able to feel the hardness. And so um, as you will see here on this one, you have muscle. And um, I'm dissecting directly on top of the muscle and the implant is being removed. As you can see and appreciate the thinness of the capsule, it's almost transparent. Um, and I'm directly on top of the muscle. If I go a couple of millimeters deep, I can run into the intercostal vessels. Can, there can be a lot of bleeding. Um, so this is, again, very tedious dissection. Uh, and again, as you can see here, uh, you have the skeletal muscle uh, right here. And then I'm essentially dissecting over here with the bovi medially superficially, posterior, and then laterally, working centimeter by centimeter, millimeter by millimeter, such that I'm able to essentially shell it out, literally, with the in entire capsule and the implant removed and block. Um, now, this is, again, as you can see, a nice, viable, healthy flap. I'm directly on top. This is the distance, and you can see, even with this, uh, Lens, uh, 
it does not deliver with ease. And as you will see on the videos, uh, you have to push it a little, but enough of a dissection such that it will allow for the explant uh, of the implant with the capsule as one entity, one piece, one system. And as you can see right here, this is post removal. And this is the skeletal muscle right here. There is just from the palpation from the fingertips, there is no residual capsule. There is no hardening of the tissues. There is no residual disease left behind. And here I am removing the entire capsule and block. And this is right on top of the muscle. As you can appreciate again, the significance of the dissection. And here I am lifting. It's a nice pocket, right? Shiny, good, native, healthy tissue. From palpation, I can tell this is good, healthy, viable tissue. There is no residual disease. Now, as you will see shortly, as I'm inside, my goal is to remove the implant, to remove the capsule as one system, which is the end block. Number two, if I find any abnormal fluid, it's going straight to cytology, as you will see on one of the pictures, because I have to rule out BIA ALCLS, which we all know is the breast implant associated and a plastic large cell lymphoma because this is the cancer that we know that's associated with the implants, primarily with textured implants, hence France uh, banning it a couple of months ago. Um, and so, uh, and this has been very well uh, established um, and published um, that uh, any f uh, f abnormal fluid needs to be sent to cytology. Now, as I'm inside, as you can imagine, you have a chance to put your hand inside and you can get the perfect breast exam because you're actually touching the breast tissue, the native tissue, and you're not only touching it from the inside but from the top, and then you're palpating and making sure if there is any masses, guess what, I'm gonna send it straight to pathology because I could be sitting on breast cancer. Now, as you will see, um, as I've pointed out in my many talks, one out of eight or nine women are gonna get breast cancer. And so this is a very good time and opportunity for me to do a good exam and see if there's anything pathologic. I'm gonna go ahead and remove it for two reasons. Number one, it could be cancer. I wanna make sure I'm not gonna sit on it, especially when I was in the chest cavity. Number two, I wanna make sure that if this lady wants to get a mammogram, which she's gonna get uh, per uh, AMA standard guidelines, I don't want it to pick up on a mass that I was sitting on Number two, I want to make sure that there is no residual capsule that an ultrasound or an MRI is going to potentially pick up on and the patient is now going to get unnecessary biopsies because it was a scar that was left behind. So palpation and a full exam, the third aspect of the surgery itself is critical and crucial because that's the window of opportunity that I have and the patient has in order to definitively and conclusively say, at least on my exam, I did not find anything that needs to be sent. Now, just to be complete, mammogram will pick up on calcifications that basically put the red flag up that warrants. Now, these are non-palpable. Now, that is uh, something that needs to uh, be looked into and uh, needs to be biopsied. And, and unless you biopsy, you're not going to know what it is. And you have to look at it under the microscope. So as you can see, it's a nice deep pocket. It's a huge area. Now, I'll tell you, so far, I have not put a drain in in any of my patients. Uh, and I say this with confidence because I took my time to dissect. The bleeding is essentially minimal uh, to none. This is a skeletal muscle, nice, good, viable, healthy tissue. Uh, there is no, I do the other side, then I come back and I find with confidence there is no bleeders because I've addressed it all. And again, as you can see right here, this is a nice deep pocket, good, healthy, native tissue remaining behind, no diseased tissue, nothing hard, nothing indurated, nice and viable. And as you can see right here, I'm now working on the left aspect of the breast tissue end block removal and uh, meticulous dissection with the bovie cautery, which is the way to dissect so that there is no uh, bleeding and you're essentially riding on top of the capsule. And as you can see right here, end block removal of the right and left. Um, and uh, as you will see on the videos, again, on Khan Plastic Surgery Academy, how I cut through so that essentially for the first time, the implants are now exposed to air. So if there's any spillage, any contents, ruptured implants, silica, whatever it may be, it is all contained. There might be mold inside. There might be abscess. There might be pus. So again, very important. 
So right and left, as you can see, there is no uh, implant that's visualized. And then uh, this is another second set. As you can see, when I was dissecting and palpating, as you can see right here, abnormal tissue. I removed it with the end block resection. I don't want to leave this behind. If I do, mammogram is going to pick up on it. Patient's going to get an unnecessary ultrasound, possibly an MRI, unnecessary biopsy. I'm doing the exam. As a board certified general surgeon, I'm trained in doing mastectomies. I'm trained in doing lapectomies. Obviously, I don't do that for a living because I'm a board certified uh, plastic surgeon, but that certainly enhances my aspect of being able to provide for removal of this abnormal tissue. As you can see, I didn't remove it here because it was nice, but over here it's pathologic and you can see these bumps. It's relatively hard material. Uh, it may be fatty necrosis. It may be cancer, God knows what. But the pathologist is going to look at it, and I write down, rule out malignancy. Very important. And again, end block removal. So this is, again, I will say the gold standard. Now, why do I say the gold standard? Now, some of my colleagues, I tell them, you know, just this morning and last night I was talking about, you know, end block removal uh, on my drive to work, and one of my colleagues, my plastic surgery friends, is like, what do you know about end block removal? And I said, I will prove it to you. Just uh, tune in tonight or just listen to the video tomorrow because I have, you know, we have to look at evidence. We have to look at proof. If I go pull up a plastic surgery textbook right now, we can look through each and every single page. We're not going to find a book chapter on plastic surgery slash breast implant illness, standard of care. This is what needs to be done. And as you will see, what could be better than removing it and block? Really nothing, because you've removed it the best way, and you will understand shortly why. So the silica, the microbleed of the breast implants, stay in the biologic capsule. The removal of the implant alone leaves behind the silica, as you will see, the implant-based material, because it has bled into the capsule. The continued toxicity and the residual disease remains behind with this perpetual burden uh, and the insult uh, to the human body. And then this exacerbates and fuels this immunological response, and this trigger continues. Yeah, you may have the implant out. Guess what? The trigger is still there because you, all what you need is a small amount of silica, and the body itself is going to keep fighting that uh, uh, foreign body in an effort to protect itself. And then... It, this is ultimately leads to an inadequate relief and continued misery for the patient. So, as you can see on the date right here, you know, I just did this on 6-11. If you look at final diagnosis, dense fibrous cyst wall with synovial metaplasia consistent with implant capsule. Metaplasia means that the cells have gone haywire, but L second line, Surrounding benign breast parenchyma with scant refractile uh, polarizable uh, material consistent with silica. So this is the capsule that I've sent to pathology. It has silica in it. What would happen, and I ask myself, I ask the medical students, I ask every single person who it may be, general surgeons, uh, other uh, plastic surgeons, if I removed just the implant and I left the capsule behind, guess what am I going to be leaving behind? Silica. That's, if you ask me proof right here, you have to remove the capsule. Because if I had left that silica inside the chest, you're leaving part of the implant behind, if you will. So again, proof is right here. Silica, silica. Breast implant capsule must be excite, excised. This is the reason. Why? Now, I will tell you, I'm learning from my colleagues. I'm learning from my patients. I remember when I went to medical school, the dean of the medical school said, the good doc is the one who's always learning. Medicine 10 years ago is very different than what it is now. 10 years from now is going to be very different. 20 years from now is going to be very different. Medicine in the 90s, very different. Um, and so the point here is, at the end of the day, no matter what, this is firm, this is rigid proof, and this is undeniable. And so this is the reason why the capsulectomy, i.e. removal of the capsule, 
along with the implant and block is the best way to go. There is no other better way. If there is, I ask my colleagues to call me and I will listen in. So what is a total capsulectomy? So this is the next level down, if you will, where you're removing the capsule and you are essentially removing the implant but not necessarily at the same time or you may have a break in the capsule such that there might be some spillage of the internal aspect of the capsule and the implant. So basically, uh, this may lead to ultimately spillage of the internal capsular contents, as you will see. Now, I, my goal for every surgery is to do end block. Am I successful each and every single time? No, as you will see shortly, because you never know. I will tell you, I never know what am I going to find till I go in. The first question I ask my patients is, who did your surgery? Because I want to make sure it's the standard of care, an ASPS board certified surgeon who did it underneath the muscle, preferably because you have more predictable results uh, and the better outcome ultimately, if you ask me. But there are many, as you will see shortly, plastic surgeries, especially best breast augmentations that are done by non-plastic surgeons, non-ASPS board certified, which is ultimately leading to more problems, um, as you will see shortly. So the surgeon removes the implant with a capsule that may have been torn in places during the meticulous dissection, which certainly can happen on the chest wall. You don't want to compromise the patient's health um, or essentially uh, leave the capsule. But you can essentially very carefully remove the capsule or the diseased part because remember, you can remove the capsule because it's hard. If it's abnormal, you can remove it. You can scrape it off such that the capsule that sometimes, even in the best of the hands, 100% cannot be removed because of the patient's safety. Then you can at least remove the burden and just be upfront with the patient. You know what? I tried my best, but I didn't want to compromise you. You certainly have that challenge, but you can, I will tell you, still remove it safely. Uh, because, for example, if I'm on top of the chest wall and you have a muscle, and I know right underneath the muscle is the lung, I can go ahead and, with my headlight and with my magnifying slash glasses at two and a half times mags, I can basically see what the burden is on top, and I can wash, wash, irrigate, such that the burden is going to be removed, uh, literally to essentially non uh, pathologic uh, uh, concentration. So again, the goal being the gold standard and block resection. So over here, I'm going to go ahead and start uh, basically discussing some of the patients. These are all my patients that I've managed. You know, the, this nice lady came in with silicon, uh, basically implant on the right side, and then saline implant on the left side. And as you can see, she has had a uh, contracture. This is a mastectomy scar. Um, and so the gold standard here is end block. As I'm going in, I'm mentally prepared. This is how I'm gonna do it. I've boarded the patient not for an hour and a half, but for three hours, and basically making sure that I have that uh, time window. Patient had a lot of chest pain, just hugging, for example, someone uh, was a lot of discomfort. And so the uh, patient was taken to the OR. I started off with the right side. And as you can see over here, a lot of thickened and hardened tissue, what I would call grade uh, four contracture. Very hard. As I made my cut, to my surprise, lo and behold, there is this biofilm slash consistent with slime where there is, there is this bacterial type burton I'm caught by surprise because I was not expecting this. You would think that this would present itself to the surface. The patient has cellulitis, infection, patient's mounting a fever, chills. And as you can see right here, there is that creamy discharge. So I'm now all of a sudden, what do I do? I backtrack and I say, okay, I have to remove the capsule. I have to, now unblock is not gonna happen because the implant has seen air. But guess what? The implant has to be removed. The entire capsule has to be removed. So someone who is in New Zealand who wants to do this, you have to remove the capsule. That's the take-home message. So what I do is I close it 
now I know what I'm dealing with. And purulent discharge, as you can see, it's angry tissue, hence the patient's presentation. Here is the capsule on the inside. I removed the implant. Here is the capsule on the inside, and you can see the chest wall, right? It's right on top of the chest wall, and it is very thick. If you can imagine taking sugar and putting it on native tissue and how the crystals form and passing your fingers on top of tissue, that's it's like sandpaper, all pathologic. And you can see, I tried to, there is the small amount of blood, but guess what? I, what do I keep telling myself? The capsule has to go. I start and see, look, the thick capsule must be excised. You see how thick that is? And look at the thinness from the skin to the capsule. To the untrained hand, I'm going to leave the capsule behind. That's what they're going to say. Because if you remove the capsule, you will inevitably kill the skin. You have to remove the capsule. I don't care. Because if you leave the capsule behind, you have done the patient disservice. So the patient had history of breast cancer. I have to send the scar to pathology because this could be a recurrence to prove otherwise. The tissue was sent to rule out malignancy. This certainly could be a recurrence. The fluid was sent to cytology to make sure this is not ALCL because the eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know. Microbiology cultures, fungal cultures, and then mastectomy scar sent to pathology. Everything. And guess what? I started on my dissection, taking my time. Here I am. I closed that mouth where there was the badness so there is no spillage. This is the chest wall, dissection with healthy, viable muscle remaining behind. Very difficult. As you can imagine, you have something essentially super glued onto the chest wall. That's what it is. Good, viable muscle. Bad capsule, here's my hand, here's my retraction. Capsule removed without spillage of internal contents to the point where I said I'm not going to put drains because there was not a drop of badness that went into the chest cavity because if there is, you're obligated and putting in drains because now if you can imagine you take a drop off a pollutant and put it in the chest cavity, all of a sudden that's going to grow on a petri dish because that's the best petri dish, right, muscle? And it's going to basically become an abscess and a problem. Dissection done very meticulously. Good muscle remaining behind. The entire capsule removed in its entirety without spillage of the contents into the chest wall. Very tedious dissection. And as you can see, nice, healthy, viable muscle after excision of the total capsule, total capsulectomy. No capsule left behind. And then, this is another window right here, as you can see, nice good breast tissue. Did you see that picture, that yellow crustiness? See that bad capsule all the way around? Just imagine you have to shell it out. All of that was removed as one entity, as you can see right here, right here. I removed it, and you're going to see it. Let's go ahead and go back here. No drains inserted. Patient's actually right here with us in the audience, uh, and she's smiling. Uh, no spillage of the internal contents despite total capsulectomy. No residual capsule left behind, and removal of the implant plus the capsule, what you would call the total capsulectomy. Not 90%. If I did the 90%, there is a residual 10% that's continued trigger problem. Guess what? Here's the ruptured implant. Here's the total capsule, entire capsule removed, ruptured. What would happen if I left some of that capsule inside? Infection, abscess, pus, fungal infection, possible cancer, God knows, because I don't know in the OR. I'm not sending it for frozen where the pathologist is looking at it within 15 minutes. So the entire capsule, and I'll tell you this, I felt very good about removing it end block, i.e., not the end block, end block, but as no spillage because I dare not close the wound and expect any spillage into the chest cavity minus no drain because that's only a 
a setup for badness. And the patient did not get an infection because I felt very comfortable with my dissection. Very tedious again. So I have another patient, 82-year-old female, driving her car, ended up in a ditch, spun on ice, had a rupture of the implant. She came to me after she had the full workup by the trauma team. MRI showed a rupture along with uh, basically a hematoma, which is a collection of blood because she was on Coumadin. Thins the blood because the thinning of the blood is required, otherwise you might shoot a clot, you might get a, a pulmonary embolus, which means a clot or a, uh, essentially uh, a clot that may shoot into the legs or into the brain and cause problems or into the lungs that may cause uh, disruption of the blood supply. So again, take home message, removal of the capsule and the ruptured implant and the hematoma. Very tricky, now guess what, this is like you not only have to remove the implant, you have to remove the capsule, you have to remove the hematoma, which is the collection of blood, which is what we know from the MRI, and the patient's 82, and the patient has a liquefied hematoma, which means it's not clotted blood. It is essentially liquefied. It initially becomes coagulative and then becomes liquefied. And this, you have to send it out Again, ALCL, breast cancer, microorganisms. Again, no drains, spillage of the contents that would deter. And again, patient did very well. Pathology, pathology, pathology. And so as you can see, this is the patient. Abnormal mass palpated. You're obligated in removing it. This is not the clot. This is the ruptured implant right out of the patient. And as you can see, seepage of the contents. This is very old first generation, second gen generation implants. So the goal of the surgery is removal of the implant plus the capsule and block. Number one, very important. Take a message. Number two, check for any abnormal fluid. Send it to cytology. It could be ALCL. It could be lymphoma. And number three, any abnormal masses, send to pathology. This is a no-brainer slide. We have, this is like the template, um, because we want to gather, we want to get information, and we want to do the operation so that you have removed the burden of not only the implant, but the capsule and whatever it may have generated over the years. So this is the ruptured implant uh, on this very nice patient. Very tricky operation, and I did the surgery, believe it or not, while the patient was on Coumadin, I just wanted to make sure her INR was not five or four, because that may lead to unnecessary problems, but I wanted to uh, basically, uh, and I feel very comfortable with my dissection uh, because of uh, you know my uh, nature of the dissections and experiences over the years. So I operate on carpal tunnel patients, for example, on Plavix. Uh, I operate on patients who are on blood thinners or in Coumadin. I just want to make sure that uh, the INR is not uh, horribly high. Otherwise, this will lead to complications inevitably. These are relatively, and again, it's all that tedious meticulous dissection that needs to be undertaken in order to be in the right tissue plane. So you get what your goal of the operation is. So ruptured implant with abnormal tissue, all abnormal tissue must be, must be removed. Guess what? She gets a mammogram. She's heading towards an unnecessary biopsy because it was not removed. So this is another patient uh, who had a ruptured saline implant. Uh, residual yellow fluid. Now saline, as you know, is what they say the better implant to have, which you know, it may be true, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's still an implant, and it's a breast implant, so it comes with its own set of problems. So this implant ruptured, and you can see the residual fluid. I'm not going to toss it and be done. No. In my practice, I always tell the patient, take the implant home. This is yours. You never know. You can keep it, uh, you know, for yourself, and many patients come up with a list of requests, and I say, please do so, because you want to be the educated uh, consumer, patient, so that you are prepared. Number two, I always send cultures for aerobic and aerobic microbiology. Now, I try to push for that because what's the worst thing that's going to happen? You send it for nothing, but at least we know. I have sent cultures in my training on a patient, believe it or not, came back as TB. 
I was surprised. My uh, boss was surprised, and I was like, wow. You know, where, and but guess what? When he asked the patient, she was overseas. She was on a mission, and lo and behold, she had basically indolent TB, and surprise, to my surprise, and I'll never forget it. Uh, but the bottom line is, so to send the implants, give the implants to the patient, that's very fair game. Number two, sending the cultures for aerobic, anaerobic, and fungal. Uh, number three, sending any fluid to cytology, and this is the perfect example, uh, because again, the eyes don't see what the mind doesn't know, and you don't want to be sitting on ALCL, because what is lymphoma? Why did it happen? Because the body is mounting an immune response, it recognizes the implant as foreign, and it basically goes on overdrive, and all of a sudden the immune system goes on haywire, uh, basically, and now the lymphoma slash sign symptoms uh, evolve. Um, and so, uh, and luckily for this nice patient, there was no ALCL. It's a rare, but a recognized entity, and hence friends stepping up and saying it's, uh, the textured implants are banned. So as you can see, it's very thick and viscous. It's like you're pouring honey, and you can see the drop by drop, and these are droplets. This is not liquid that will accumulate and drain. This is like honey and just settling in. This is silica, if you ask me. You know, I do not know, but they have to do their homework, the pathologist. And as you can see, it's accumulating on one side. And again, you see these are the droplets of this abnormal fluid, which, uh, which needs and must be sent according to the standard of care. We want information, we have information, we want to make sure that we're not missing something. So dissection is very meticulous. Uh, you know, once I got done with my 630 case, I look at my uh, assistant, I said, we have a fourth one today, and she's like, no, no, we're, I'm done. <laughs> because, you know, it's about the retraction, it's about literally uh, continuous movement of the shoulder, and you're making fine, fine moves such that you're basically going uh, and approaching this in a very thoughtful, systematic way so that you, you can. Again, the punchline is removing the entire capsule and the implant and block. Now, there are a lot of things that we have to take into consideration. Now, what is the first question I ask my patients, and this is to the audience, not only here but all over the world, um, whoever is listening, you have to go, you have to go, and you have to go to a verified surgery center. You know, there are patients that have come in my office who said that I went to another doc who basically said, sit right here, you're in a small procedure room, and I'll get a local, and we'll take care of this 20 minutes each side and you should be done soon. There's a patient right here in this room, very nice lady. She was told $700 to remove the implants. I'm not making this up. Um, uh, you know, and so $700 to remove the implants. And I'll tell you this, where on earth do you get this? Um, you know, and this is happening right here in town. Um, there are patients that are being operated on in a non-verifiable surgical facility where you know you have risks off guess what if you don't have a clean room like that and real operating room like at this hospital or a verified what they call uh, the quad sf which is the gold standard you're compromising the patient because you could get someone who because of the ventilation system introduce bacteria that may be on someone's glove into the chest cavity and now you have given them badness for no reason because you just wanted to cut corners and compromise the patient care. Unacceptable. Um, and I have to say this type of activity should be literally uh, illegal and banned because you're doing the patient a service who doesn't know better. Now if I tell you if I was not a patient or if I was not a physician, I would not know this uh, because you know, if you ask me about what each one of you guys do, I will not be good at it because I do not do that for a living and I do not do that. But there is a certain standard that needs to be met and uh, there should be no compromise in the delivery of surgical care, period. No exceptions. Um, and so basically, what is the quad um, AA, AASF, the American Association for Accreditation of Ambulatory Surgical Facilities. These are facilities outside of the hospital. Obviously, the hospitals are regulated. They maintain the high standards um, uh, for outpatient accreditation. How many infections have you had? How many problems, complications? Uh, is your equipment sterile? And so every so often they come by and they keep a tab on what the surgeries you have done and they 
maintain a standard uh, so that you're not overlooking, say, the autoclave, which is not working and it's basically leaking air, and all of a sudden the equipment that you're using is not truly sterile. And they pick up on infections, for example, that the patient could have had, and it was not the implant, but guess what? It was the bad surgical facility or the bad tools or bad whatever it may be. So you have to go to a cert verified surgical center. If you can imagine, this is a no-brainer. And I'll tell you to all the patients who are listening and who will listen to this talk, this is an absolute must and an absolute no-brainer. Don't settle for less. You get what you pay for. This is very important. And you can, uh, so this presentation will be on my uh, webpage, uh, uh, executiveplasticsurgery.com. And again, use this as a template, whoever it may be, be it overseas, so that you can say, all right, this is a no-brainer. Uh, there is not much thinking here. Um, that you have to go to a, a reputable place, pay extra, you don't want to cause more problems. Um, and then as you can see, uh, this is um, the standard of care and the highest standard. Number, this is a, also a very important slide. You know, you need to, a lot of factors to be considered. You know, there is a patient that came, uh, and I say this very openly, but things uh, that we need to take into consideration the patient was pregnant and said, okay, I want the implants out. Absolutely not gonna happen because it's a threat to the baby and ultimately the threat to the mom. You know, it's not a simple surgery. This is a big deal. This is, relatively speaking, elective surgery. Um, so you have to make sure that you have done the homework. You know, I say this, uh, there are a lot of young men and women who get cardiac issues, they have arrhythmias. I saw a 23-year-old who had cardiomyopathy, spontaneous. This is what you see on TV, a basketball player running, all of a sudden drops dead because his heart gave out, he had a dilated heart. Uh, or, so the point is, you wanna make sure that you go to your primary care doctor and you get the basic subset of tests done, EKG, CBC with diff, make sure you don't have, God forbid, whatever it may be, an infection. Um, you may uh, have no GI issues, you may not have celiac disease, you know, you may not have, uh, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, headaches that majority of the patients get, and certainly they don't have implants, you know, so just do your, your basic homework so that we are not attributing these sign symptoms to breast implant disease where they may be part of the patient's disease pattern, let's say, had they not had the implants. So, uh, chest x-ray, ultrasound MRI. Another patient right here in this group uh, who went to a facility who I examined. The first question I asked, who put your implants? Big red flag. And I said, you know what? I don't like your exam. I want to get an MRI. Patients over here, she's smiling. Who, and she knows who she is. There is a 2.3 centimeter mass on the left upper breast at the nine o'clock position, three centimeters from the nipple, oval mass. So it's a big red flag. Now I'll tell you this, that other doc was not gonna pick up on it because he was gonna charge only $700 for it. There was gonna be a 15 minute per side case. This is a big deal. I called the physician up, the radiology uh, imaging uh, doc and said, you know what, what's this mass? I'm going in removing the implants. She did an ultrasound, she and I talked, just like I would, for example. I'm gonna go into her chest. This is my window of opportunity to go in and remove this mass. And so she and I conversed and I said, you know what, I'm gonna look for it. I know exactly where to go. This is like very similar to a Navy SEAL mission. You're planning this out. You know where to go, what to look out for, and come right out of Dodge, because you don't wanna go and do unnecessary dissections. But guess what, you're looking for the 2.3 centimeter mass. If you miss it, you do the patient disservice. I go and look. Now, they don't want to do any biopsies because they might puncture the implant, right, and cause a bleed. So now the burden's on me to go in first. I can time it with them, but we want to do it separately, no problems. Um, so now the patient is had this. When I did the exam, I was looking for it. I looked. Now, these masses, sometimes you can see on the MRI, which is a very sensitive test and picks up on tissue that you might not necessarily pick up on, just like calcifications. So the bottom line is now the patient's scheduled to go see a breast surgeon who's gonna do a needle look and remove this so that we know definitively and conclusively that this is not breast cancer so that the patient can rest 
and be not anxious and say this is not a problem related to malignancy because one or out of eight or nine women are going to get breast cancer. So you want to get mammograms. A patient came, she had a mammogram, and it picked up on three masses. They want to do something, they cannot because the implant's sitting right next to this, and so they say you want to get the implant out. So mammograms are important. They help detect microcalcifications, red flags that ultimately, you know, save lives. Um, and this is what I would call another mode of imaging where you're picking up on potential cancer because it's so prevalent, it's so common. Um, so in summary, do the homework, go to your primary care doctor. One thing I say, unfortunately, your primary care doctor is what, what is breast implant illness? They're not going to recognize this. They're going to attribute this to, okay, you need to go see a psychiatrist. This is all in your head. You got anxiety. You got shortness of breath. This one same patient went to the emergency room over 10 times, and she was told you're trying to take advantage. You don't want to work. You have psych issues. Unfortunately, this is because they're saying all your tests are negative, and she had, I would say, at least a $30,000 workup without any exaggeration. Um, now, um, now, at the same time, you need to look at this pattern and say, what is breast implant illness? And you need to start as you get more and more access as to what it is not, the chances of you getting breast implant illness high. And I tell all my patients, I'm not going to guarantee anything except for the fact that once the implants are removed and blocked, before and after, you will see the dramatic result. Three hours ago, I saw a patient. I removed the implants and block. She said, I didn't have back pain. I can move around. This was 172 hours ago. She looks bright. She is energetic. You can see it in her eyes. And I say to her, listen, just keep a log so you can compare the before and after because you know, many people say this is a placebo effect. This is all in your head. You know, what's a placebo effect? If you give someone who's sick chalk or some calcium pill and say, this is your medication that's going to cure you, in your mind you say, well, I'm cured because I got the regimen. You know, you cannot have that dramatic a result. And as I was uh, saying in my other talks, you know, one person may be wrong, two people can be wrong, but not tens of thousands of patients, not only in the U.S., but across the globe, where you know deep down within definitively this was the implant, this was the trigger, because you could not be making it up. The patient cannot be making it up. The patient cannot go from like zero to 100 in one week. Uh, you know, this is not a placebo effect, and this is very, very real. So what you can do is, you know, I have my, uh, so a lot of patients ask, where can I get this information? You know, I talked to a friend of mine Last night, he's a plastic surgeon in Utah, and he said one of his very close friends that he knows of in California, he's the king of breast surgery, microsurgery, reconstruction, deep flaps, uh, reconstruction using the latissimus uh, flap, implants, saline, silicone. He has written books. With all due respect, he's leaving behind the capsule. Remember that one slide with the silica? That's my proof why I removed the capsule. Why do you not want to remove it just because it's a hard operation? You do not want to not do it because it's a hard operation. Um, so executive plastic surgeon, uh, and, and please if you go and, so very important, very, very important. This is the gold standard, American Society of Plastic Surgeons. It's authentic and certified. If you don't see this, you're not getting the real deal. You're getting what I would call compromised care. Because as you will see shortly, you have the ASPS surgeons. So this is a take home slide right here. Very, very important. ASPS surgeons member good versus the bad. You, I call them elastic surgeons. They stretch things. They are not who they are. They're not plastic surgeons. They basically do on-the-job training, three months, six months, shadow someone. And ENT surgeons right here in town, who are basically what I would call bent. You know, they're trained in ear, nose, throat, but not breast. 
So that's the B. OBGYN docs putting in implants, not making this up. Emergency room docs. And I was joking one of the patients, I said it was not an emergency that the emergency room doc had to do it. Um, uh, cardiologists, I'm not exaggerating. Last week I met a patient who told me, a GI gastroenterologist that I know in town who's doing liposuctions. Right here in town, uh, uh, practicing at a reputable hospital, this is what you're looking for. Stay away. Danger. Uh, and I say this very openly because this is, again, a no-brainer. You have to go to a board-certified plastic surgeon who knows what they're doing. You cannot imagine the hours, the training, the sophistication, the professionalism the society has in order to be a part of this group. Uh, we go through so much training. You have to have like myself, a general surgery training, five years. Um, I want to say 120 hours a week, but they capped it at 80, but I was definitely working for five years. I did my two years of burn, and then three years of plastics, 10 years in the making. My other colleagues who are ASPS certified are orthopedic surgeons, five years, and then they did three years off plastic surgery training, and they are part of this group. My other friends and colleagues who did ENT, and then they did three years and are part of this group. My other colleagues, who are the real deal, are neurosurgeons. They did six years of neurosurgery, seven years, and then guess what? They did three years of this, and they're the real deal. So you have to make sure, if, first thing, if you don't see this logo, is the problem. This is very, very important. This is just like saying, this is a genuine, authentic, certified, what you're gonna get is the doc who's trained right, who knows what they're saying, and who will hold and take care of you because they have gone through this rigorous training and the sophistication. Um, and not all docs are the same. Very important, just like you have a good driver, you have a bad driver. And same thing over here, as you will look at the bottom, there are cosmetic surgeons. That's another no-no. Uh, you know, I could be a family medicine doc, take a three-day course, and call myself certified doc and cosmetic. I can make up a board right now, American Association of Aesthetic Plastic Reconstructive Surgeons, and I could make you a member if you pay the dues. Um, so, uh, again, a lot of training, 10 years after medical school, and I say, not fear that someone jumps on because they want to make a little buck on the side. So plastic surgeon versus cosmetic surgeon, as you can see, and this is out of the Austin, I went to UT Austin, so this is the Austin Society, the Texas Society. They mentioned that this is the real deal. You don't want to go here. Cosmetic surgeon is a misnomer. It throws you off. So these are some of the examples. Emergency room doc in town, $700 for an explant. One side was silicon, the other was side was saline. One side was above the muscle, that was the done that the doc did, and probably the other side was done by a PA, was below the muscle. I seen it myself in the OR, because this is what I myself saw, and I have it on pictures. Uh, umbilical insertion of the saline implant to go through the belly button, and they pull up, and the next thing you know, they're in the wrong plane, or they go into the axilla, and then the implant migrates back to where it needs to be because they contract the muscle and it rides up. Um, I have gone in into the chest cavity, and lo and behold, I'm making this up, there is no capsule there. And I go back and look, and the mammogram, because I ask all my patients, did you get a mammogram? And the mammogram says, the capsule that was seen in 2016 is no longer seen in 2017 because it migrated because of the poor technically deficient placement of this wannabe plastic surgeon who basically offered his service to this very nice patient. So now you have to go in, rather than going and dissecting, you have to be able to define where you're dissecting so that, again, I say and use the example of a Navy SEAL mission, you have a go in, take care of the problem, 
come right out of Dodge because you don't want to get there and cause more problems. So you have to have a defined goal of the operation so that you're not wasting your time. You want to get the patient out of the table ASAP. Now, there are, you know, friends of mine who are what's breast implant illness. I will not know what to do if I'm them. If you ask me about cleft lip palate, by the way, I'm certified, I'm not going to do it. Do you know why? Because how many did I do last year? Zero. How many did I do in the last three years? Zero. I'll send it to my colleague who does them on a daily basis. My mentor, who's a genius, who trained me, he said, and you know, we live in the motor city, and I can say this with confidence, you got a transmission problem, you go to the transmission guy because this is all, all what he does. Transmissions from 8 in the morning till 6 p.m. and this is all what he knows. If you ask him to do an engine block, you're not going to be able to deliver because they don't know what they're doing. If you ask me about pediatrics, I'm going to say I have no clue because I don't deal with kids. There is separate training, separate education, and I'm not going to go in and do something that I normally don't do. Same thing. When you go and want to get this implant removed for someone, for example, who is overseas or who is in another state, you want to go to someone who does them and who's got a history of doing it. And you will be surprised the feedback from social media about the patients talking, the word gets around that this is a good surgeon, this is an okay surgeon because he removed 70% of the capsule. These are the pictures, and I see seven of those different uh, capsule segments consistent with what is equal to spillage of the capsular contents into the chest cavity. Now you're obligated in putting in the drains. The capsule itself has inserted and there is a problem. So uh, breast explant expert, you must go to a surgeon who ideal, daily only explants. I'll tell you that's your best bet. You know, my, like my colleagues, as we know, in Cleveland um, and in California, we know who we're talking about. Uh, the ASPS logo is key. Don't settle for less. Uh, end block removal, gold standard. Total capsulectomy, if you remove the whole capsule without spillage, acceptable and very, very kosher, very, very good. Um, and uh, wherever the dissection is challenging, you remove and you can remove um, and you use the experience and the expertise to remove all the capsular burden, very important. Last but not least, you know, be your own boss. You know, we all are smart. We know what we're doing. We know what we're saying. We have to think independently and coherently. There are a lot of forces, just like major decisions we make in our life. You know, sometimes we say, oh, I don't want implants, but my significant other said, it's good for you, and I said, sure. Not good. Uh, it's your decision. You know, it's a big deal. Um, someone who gets them in their 20s, if you did not want them, the average lifespan on the chest is 10 years, some shorter, some longer. You want to be able to say to yourself, if I'm going to live up to 82, the average lifespan of an American woman, uh, you're going to get these theoretically exchanged five times in your lifetime, maybe twice, maybe three times, maybe nine times, I do not know. But the bottom line is, you want to make an informed decision, and if that's the decision you make, certainly go for it, because you're the boss. Uh, and then uh, that's pretty much it. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and invite my very close friend, uh, Tracy, who I just met not too long ago, and she and I have talked and talked, and I said, you know what, I'll be very happy to have you if you want to come and talk and discuss, because what we want to do here is we want to increase awareness. We want people to talk, and we want people to say, that is what I believe in, this is something that we cannot hide from. This is something we need to start talking and discussing so that we can give the relief to the women who very well and very much deserve and need it. Because sometimes, you know, when you're out of trouble, you know, things are good. But remember, when you were in trouble, like I have been and we all have been, and say, all right, what I can do to help someone so that I can make a big difference in not their life, but their husband, their kids, their work, their society in general. So uh, with having said that, I'm going to have Tracy, if you could please come in here. And I think all of us know who Tracy is. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. 
Hi, thank you. I just want, I want to read something first because one of your patients messaged me on the way here mm -hmm. and said I could share this with everyone. Um, I won't say your name, but she said, I just lost it. Saw, she saw all her videos and pictures, which is very important. If you're going to get your breast implants removed, you want to find a doctor who is not afraid to show you pictures of the surgery. And inside, like he's showing you up here, the picture inside your, your breast cavity to make sure everything was removed. Because a lot of doctors, like he's saying, will just yank them out and you will stay sick. And then all these plastic surgeons and all the doctors out there are saying, oh, the BII doesn't exist. Well, it certainly exists. And, and it's because you didn't remove them properly. And these women stay sick. So she's saying, uh, it was a beautiful end block. So for the record, no drains. I didn't have drains either. Did you have drains, Annette? No. Uh, no seroma, no meds besides antibiotics. No need for meds likely due to a microsurgeon's ability. Very important to have a microsurgeon. I can't even stress the importance of having a microsurgeon. You don't want them poking and poking through to your lungs. And if they do, you, you, you need to be in capable hands because it happens. It does happen even with the best doctors. You need to be in really good hands. She didn't get a lift, didn't need a lift. All is good. I'll send my symptoms and relieved symptoms in another message. So that's, that's a patient I just met last week, I think it was, with Annette. And um, she's doing great. But my story was I got implants at 33 years old. Um, didn't know that, I thought they were lifetime. I was told I'd be put in the grave and your breasts will look great, you might look bad, but your breasts will always look like you're 20. And that wasn't the case. I had a rupture at, uh, 12 years later. They were saline. I had them removed with smooth saline. I had textured, which are the ones that are now causing cancer. And the cancer that he was just talking about is a man-made cancer only created by these implants. You need to know this. If you're thinking of getting implants or if you have them in, this cancer is only created by having implants. So I, I think we're taking time bombs. I, I understand some people don't react to them. I get it, I don't react to peanuts. So not everybody's gonna react. I have friends who have implants, they're not reacting to them. So I get it, they think I'm crazy, but I'm not. Some people are allergic, some aren't. Something happened, I don't do well with implants. So I had 50 symptoms, they all went away. Almost immediately upon explant, um, lower back pain, so debilitating, I thought I was gonna have to have surgery. My husband, who just walked in, would have to pull me out of bed with my son, this went on for 20 years, pull me out of bed screaming, screaming in pain, and then tell me to walk around because it would loosen up, and then all of a sudden he'd come in 10 minutes later after he took a shower, and he'd say, how's your back? Just fine. It would come and go just as fast, it would leave as fast as it came on. I had neck pain, I had elbow pain. The elbow pain went away the day of surgery. I was putting my hospital gown on, and thought, oh my gosh, these women that claim their, their joint pain goes away the day of surgery, I hope I'm one of them. I have not had that elbow pain since the day they took the implants out. I have not had migraines. I had migraine medication for 20 years. I had been put on ADD medication because I was losing my brain. I was becoming brain dead. And I flew in the chopper over Detroit for 15 years. And it was a tough job. And I was telling my husband the job I did. And then I had to do this, 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 this. I had 12 things I had to juggle at one time on the morning show. Now the afternoon was calmer, but the morning show I had 12 things to handle up in that chopper at one time. My brain got so bad I was missing cues. So he would ask me, what are you gonna cover? And I would tell him, oh, I'll cover this. 30 seconds, I'm not kidding, 30 seconds later, they would throw it to me, and I could be five miles over. So now I cover something else. So the people on the ground are like, oh my gosh, you're screwing everything up. It was, I was constantly screwing up. I was losing my brain. I couldn't even think anymore. So it, it doesn't just affect you physically, it affects you mentally. I don't know if it's all connected to the inflammation. I'm not sure, 
but I know I had 50 symptoms that went away completely. I don't even get headaches anymore. I, I've taken Tylenol maybe once, and it might have been because I drank too much. And I'm not even getting hangovers. Like, I would get a hangover from one or two glasses of wine. A hangover, a full-blown hangover from one beer, two beers. I don't get anything anymore, nothing. I had food intolerances. I, I was pretty much eating vegan, and food intolerances, like you wouldn't believe, and now I eat everything. I can eat everything and I'm not reacting. So I was reacting to all kinds of foods. I wasn't metabolizing medications. Um, I couldn't take any medications. The back pain, they couldn't find anything. MRI, x-rays, they could never find anything wrong. My, bl my blood work would come back okay. It would show my hormones were all tanked. Now I'm on nothing. I was, I was on bioidentical hormone replacement. I was on thyroid medication. I am on nothing. I take nothing, nothing, and I'm fine. All my blood work now is fine. The only difference is the implants are gone. So I'm just telling you, if you have them in, or if you're thinking of getting them, or if you think you have some of the symptoms, they slowly kill us. I thought I was dying. I, I was, felt like I was being poisoned. So if you have any symptoms, be warned. And, and if you need a doctor, because somebody, <laughs> the person who grew up in the house that we live in, sent me your flyer. The kid that grew up in my house that we live in <laughs> sent a flyer. And I'm like, who's this guy? Saying he's an explant expert. And all of a sudden, we get connected, and we have an explant guy in Michigan who's not only explanting properly, because you can explant, you're not doing it properly. Most of them are not. There's a handful that are doing it properly, and this is one of them. And to come out publicly, publicly, and tell people that breast implant illness is real and to back us up is huge. And I really have to applaud you. I really do. At first I was like, who's this Dr. Khan? And now I, I totally have so much respect for you, I can't even tell you. So thank you very much, because it is real, and if you need a good explant doctor, I've been researching, and I do think you are the real deal, and I do think he's doing good explants. So thank you very much, and, and, and I can take questions if anybody has them.